Hello students, Professor Newton here. In the next set of videos, we are going to think about an additional dimension to our data sets. We have thus far focused on cross-sectional data, where we have observations on individuals at a moment in time. We are now going to think about data with both a cross-sectional and a time series dimension. In the first few videos, we're going to study pooling independent cross-sections across time. So we will have observations on different individuals at different points in time. We will observe each individual just once. Take a look at the hypothetical data set on the screen. We have observations for Jack, Jill, Mary, and Joe. We observe, or we have data on Jack for just one year, 2018. Data for Jill for just one year, 2018. Data for Mary, just one year, 2020. And Joe, 2020. So we have observations on, or we have an observation on one individual uh, just once. Okay, so Joe just represents one observation because we only observe Joe at one moment in time. This will be a little bit different from panel data where we will see in a few videos that we observe the same individual for several time periods. So what we're doing here with pooling independent cross-sections across time is that we are sampling randomly from a population at different moments in time. An example of this is to randomly sample hourly wages, education, experience, etc. from the labor force population in the United States in 2016 and 2018. You could pull those independent cross-sections across time. This data consists of independently sampled observations, ruling out correlation in error across the different observations, across the observational units I, which is important for uh, making good inference. Sampling at different moments in time does mean that the observations are unlikely to be identically distributed. So we can think about perhaps the distribution of wages in education changes over time in the labor force population in the United States. The distribution of wages in 2020 does not look like the distribution of wages in 1960. And so this is something that we are going to have to, re have to wrestle with, um, and we'll think about how to wrestle with that now. We can use year dummies, in other words, year fixed effects, to account for the change in distributions over time. All right, so we're looking at year dummies, which are also known as year fixed effects. We use a year dummy in a regression for all years in the sample except one, which allows the intercept to vary over time. To vary over time, and what we're doing is including a dummy for each year in the data set minus one. And why do we include a dummy for each year minus one? Well, we don't want to fall for the, uh, the dummy variable trap. 
And what this does is to control for the unobserved stuff that is changing over time in relation to the variables of interest, which is really important for economic aggregates. Um, the movement in these economic aggregates is correlated over time, which results in the change in the distribution of the observations. Uh, and, and this movement is affected by other economic forces that are unobserved. And so by including these your dummies, we are able to we are able to make ceteris paribus interpretations. That is, what is the effect of X on Y holding constant the unobserved trends? This also allows for, so if we say, you know, we can make Setters Paribus interpretations. This also allows for variation in the effects of X and Y if we interact the dummy variable with X. So we interact dummy with X and allow the effect of x on y to vary with time. Let's look at an example. We can consider the example of the uh, data we can think of data on wage and other characteristics from 1978 and 1985 using the current population survey. All right, so we may have CPS 1978 and 1985. We have wage and other worker characteristics. A random sample would be drawn at each time period of wage and other worker characteristics, and we could uh, estimate the following equation. Log of wage is equal to beta naught plus delta 1 y 1985 plus beta 1 education plus beta 2 times experience plus beta 3 times female plus u where delta 1 equals 1 if the observation was collected from 1985 and is zero otherwise. Let's talk about how we interpret this equation. Beta 1 represents the return to education holding constant the unobserved time trends. Delta 1 will represent how wages change over time after controlling for observable determinants of wage. If we reject the null hypothesis that delta 1 is equal to 0, then we have evidence that the intercept changes over time. Now, even if we do not reject the null hypothesis that delta 1 is equal to 0, we will typically still include a year dummy 
because controlling for the unobserved time trend is very important. If there are multiple years, this just becomes an F test of the null hypothesis that the coefficients on the multiple year dummies were zero. But again, even if we fail to reject, it is still important to control for the unobserved time trends, as these unobserved time trends are probably correlated with the explanatory variables, and so not controlling for them leads to omitted variable bias. Now what if the return to education changes over time? We can modify this regression to think about how the, uh, we can model the return to education changing over time. We may have log of wage, which is equal to beta naught plus delta 1 times y 85 plus beta 1 times education plus delta 2 y85 times education plus beta 2 times experience plus beta 3 times female plus you. And now, delta 2 represents the change in the return to education between 1978 and 1985. If we reject the null hypothesis that delta 2 is equal to 0, then we have evidence that the return to education changes over time. Stay tuned to the next video, we will discuss the Chow test for structural change across time.